Uh, thank you very much. It is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm still very much the, the new girl um, in Oxford, um, so it's a great privilege to be asked to, to give this talk. So today I um, want to really share with you some thoughts around the whole issue of food, health and the environment and how we move towards a more sustainable diet. I'll declare a vested interest. I'm an, I'm an outright nutrition scientist and so I've really come at this from the perspective of food and health. But the more I ha work I have done, the more I guess I really see the complexity of the food system. I suspect many of us here today are quite good at acknowledging that food is a complex system, and then we quietly park that to one side and carry on with the bit we were already doing. It's, it's one thing to recognize it's, it's complicated, it's quite another to integrate those different strands together into finding solutions. So today I want to focus mostly on how do we begin to think about not only dietary advice, but dietary change, which both optimizes health, but which also acts within the constraints of a sustainable food supply. So I'll focus mostly on health, a little bit on the environment, and I'll touch on some of these other um, aspects as, as, we go, uh, as we go along. I guess I want to start by just reminding you that food, the food and drink industry in its entirety, agriculture, manufacture, retailing, hospitality sector, is an incredibly important component of, of the UK economy. All too often in health, I hear people making analogies between tobacco and food. We don't need a tobacco industry, but we do need a food industry. And that sets its own constraints on what might be possible. Because we may want to transform the system, but we need to do that in a way which remains economically viable. So just to give you some headline statistics, the food um, industry in the UK provides about one in seven jobs. It's the single largest manufacturing sector, representing 16% of our manufacturing output. And even over the last difficult years of, of the economic recession, food and drink exports have been an incredibly important part of, of our trade. And we've seen seven years now of continual growth. So just bear that in mind when you start to think about what uh, needs to be done. But the success of the food and drink industry has been heavily predicated on producing and selling more and indeed um, encouraging uh, greater production and consumption of food, particularly energy or calories. That goes right back really to the austerity of war and the need to boost home food production. But it's continued forward to the global food challenge that we face today. We sometimes, it's easy to forget in the UK where the agenda is so dominated by obesity that we live in a world where 1.2 billion people continue to be malnourished. So there's no doubt that the general production of, of more food is important, but I think we increasingly recognize that isn't just about producing more energy. It needs to also consider good nutrition too. But during that time, there's been a real shift and change in the power and the influence within the food supply chain. So if you go back to the middle of the last century, you had a situation in which governments were very, very powerful in the system. They really sought to intervene in agricultural production, to boost output, and consumers were merely passive recipients of what government uh, was doing in the market. By the 1980s, we'd seen a shift towards much more open markets. Farmers were expected to compete in a global market, and that drove increasingly efficient systems of food production, manufacture, and distribution. Over time, there's been a gradual shift, though, and by the 1990s, perhaps, and, and thereon, we've seen consumers as the dominant players in the system. It's a consumer-driven economy, and the the concept is that industry will compete to meet the demands of consumers. Now, in many ways, that could work terribly well, but the expectations have not been entirely met by the reality. The expectation 
is that this new brand of demanding consumers would choose well and a very flexible food supply would compete to meet their needs, making a healthy diet available and affordable for everyone. And that as a consequence of that, economies would gain, they'd have a thriving food sector and a much healthier population. The theory looked fantastic. The practice, of course, has been a little bit different. Because consumers are either not informed or they don't always prioritize health. And so, in fact, what's happened is that consumer demand has meant that industry has incentives to uh, actually drive people towards the most popular and often the cheapest uh, food. And at the same time, although some consumers have undoubtedly become healthier, easy to, easier to eat well today than it's perhaps ever been before, the fact is that inequalities have increased and the cost of diet-related disease has soared. We find ourselves now in a deeply unsustainable food system. We face a whole mass of both supply side pressures, um, but also demand size pressures from population growth and the changing face of diets. And that's been played out within the context of what are generally acknowledged to be relatively weak governance systems. And the consequence of that, as I've already said, is increasing inequalities. So in the UK, we see food poverty on the increase again, and health disparities are widening. And globally, it's absolutely clear that poorer countries are suffering the most, not least from some of the world trade agreements. And so if we look at this landscape, I have to say it seems an enormous challenge to consider how are we going to feed 9 billion people by 2050? Now, the model so far has put heavy reliance on supply-side measures to meet the growing demand for food. And so con the concept of sustainable intensification, which the Future of Food program has done some really nice work on, has been, um, it has been central to the discussions around increasing yields, increasing efficiency, and in small part, I'd say perhaps not strongly enough, um, increasing the nutritional benefits in every uh, unit of energy. And all of that has gone alongside the, uh, the, the need to reduce waste. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. But if we're going to increase production, it's incredibly important that we consider the environmental consequences associated uh, with that process. As it stands at the moment, the food chain in the UK contributes about 18% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Around a third of that comes from farming and fishing, and about a quarter from our, from our net, net trade. But of course, it's probably more instructive to start looking at the contribution of different, uh, different food groups. This is a nice piece of work done by um, the Food Climate Research Network in collaboration with WWF, which has looked at the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by food group. What's most striking here, of course, is the very substantial um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, ruminant animals, meat and, and dairy. But, and, and actually, here's an important difference. Health people tend to talk about red meat, beef, lamb, and pork, and distinguish that from poultry. Whereas, in fact, if we're thinking in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions, the important distinction is between the ruminant and the, the non-ruminant um, animals. This slide's also a very useful reminder that what's good for health and the environment may not always go together. So take, for example, sugar. Not generally at the top of most nutritionist shopping list for the way to a healthy diet, but actually has pretty um, low greenhouse gas uh, emissions associated with it. It's arguably one of the most environmentally friendly ways um, to become a beast. <laughs> but going back to uh, meat, the challenge with meat is not only its overall um, uh, environmental cost, it's that if we uh, look at this slide, we can see with the data from FAO 
that there are substantial predicted increases in the global demand for meat. It seems astonishing to me, but we're still predicting that meat consumption in developed countries will continue um, to rise over the next 40 years or so. But there are also likely to be very substantial increases in uh, developing and indeed the transitional countries. And if you think what that is doing in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions right now, just think how that is going to increase in the future. So if we want to avoid that scenario, but if we also believe that other countries should have the same opportunities to access the wide range of foods that we ourselves enjoy here in the UK, we probably have to begin to face up to the reality that if other countries are going to be able to eat more, we perhaps need to think about eating rather less meat um, here in countries like the UK. Since I've come to um, Oxford, it's been fantastic to be able to work a little bit more with, with, with Tara Garnett. And, and Tara really has, has already taught me a huge amount around the um, environmental impacts of meat. And this is just one of the slides she's shared with me, which really makes the point that um, livestock put enormous environmental pressures in the system. It's not just about greenhouse gas emissions. They're also major consumers of um, an estimated 40% of all the cereal food production. That's not the most efficient way for us to provide calories um, uh, to the world, as well as having a whole host of other environmental impacts. So if our primary production is imposing such a major environmental impact, it's absolutely incumbent upon us to use the food that we produce wisely. And if we accept that, then we have to see the scale of food waste as being a total scandal. Here are some, it's very difficult to get estimates of losses of food within the supply chain, but this is some work which was put together a few years ago in the Cabinet Office report, Food Matters, which tried to look at estimates of uh, losses in the supply chain. This shows maximum and minimum estimates, but it's, it's possible that more than a third of the rice harvested in Southeast Asia may be lost before it reaches uh, consumers. And this is for a crop which is relatively easy to uh, store and transport. Just think what the losses are like for much more highly perishable goods. But perhaps the thing that we really ought to uh, be thinking even harder about as individuals is the scale of household food waste. So RAP in the UK, the Waste Resources Action Plan program, something like that, has done some fantastic work in collating the statistics around the scale of food waste in the UK. So households are uh, estimated to waste 7 million tonnes of food every year. And around 60% of that is classified as being avoidable food waste. So this is primarily from very perishable goods, fruit, vegetables, bakery, um, milk, and, and some, some dairy products. Just to put that in slightly more real terms context, that's 13 billion portions of fruit and vegetables a day. That's enough for 7 million people to get their five a day. But perhaps if we look at it in a slightly different way, certainly for me it resonates even more. What if we could avoid this food waste? What would be the benefits that we could achieve? And the fact is that eliminating avoidable waste would directly save customers money. So it's estimated that we each spend about, or waste, about nine pounds a week per household on food that is ultimately thrown away. That food has had to be produced, and so the carbon reduction savings, if we had not produced food, which we then throw away, are the equivalent of taking one in four cars completely off the road. And think of all that land which we're currently using to produce food, which would then be freed up for other purposes. The acreage is equivalent to about 90% of the size of Wales. 
That's an awful lot of land that we could do a whole host of other things with. And I really do think that this is almost a no-brainer when we start thinking about issues of food security. It's not in any of our interests to be wasting this much food. It's my little sermon of the day. Um, so moving on now, what I hope I've begun to show you is that what consumers do and consumer demand for products, whether that's for meat or indeed um, other products, is perhaps going to be at least as important as supply-side action if we're going to try to meet uh, the challenges that, that we face. And having kind of come to this sort of position, I was very pleased to find what I have to say is quite a complicated paper from uh, Pete Smith from the University of Aberdeen, where they have um, really set out some estimates of the, the balance of um, uh, potential uh, savings in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And what they show in their paper is that the uh, potential for changes in consumer diets is several fold greater than the likely mitigation potential of reductions in the food supply chain, reductions of losses and, and waste. So they have taken estimates generated by other people and looked at what would be the consequences on greenhouse gas emissions if people, for example, were to switch to a no-ruminant meat diet, more extreme than that, no meat at all, no pork and no poultry either, or a totally plant-based diet. And you can see that we're now talking three to four-fold uh, greater, uh, greater mitigation. One might argue that that's probably going to be a little bit too extreme for many people to contemplate. So if we instead look at a more modest dietary change, something along the lines of the, of the Harvard um, eating plan, which is, includes some meat and a, a slight changes in other aspects of the diet, you've still got very, very substantial um, savings. So why can't we persuade consumers to make these sorts of changes? Even if people are not that interested in the future of the planet or the lives of their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren even, you might imagine that they would be concerned about their own health. Here are just some of the statistics of the situation we have in, in England today. One in two people have high blood cholesterol, one in three have high blood pressure, one in four are clinically obese, and one in 20 have diabetes. These are all conditions which are directly diet-related and where we have very, very good evidence that changes in diet would lead directly to uh, reductions in this health burden. What is a healthy diet? Well, there are recommendations around the world, but what I've done here is to just pull, to, uh, pull off the, the WHO um, um, healthy diet uh, plan, or at least a simplified version of it. And it really makes clear that what's important is that people should maintain, achieve and maintain a healthy weight by achieving energy balance. They need to limit the consumption of fat, particularly saturated fats, um, and as far as possible, eliminate trans fats from the diet. To increase the consumption of fruit and vegetables, limit the intake of sugar, added sugar, and limit, uh, limit salt. I know that there is huge public skepticism and believe that nutritionists change their mind every five minutes, but let me assure you that these are widely accepted, extremely stable recommendations uh, for, for good health. So obesity, in, to my mind, is really the big problem we face. If people are over-consuming food, they're consuming food they don't need, um, they're also likely to be over-consuming fat, saturated fat, sugar, and salt as well. So by addressing overconsumption, we can actually address a whole raft of the other nutritional components of, of the diet. Here's just some figures if you needed reminding of how serious the problem of obesity actually is. About a quarter of adults are clinically obese and a further 38% are overweight. About a third of young people um, uh, are, are at least overweight. And the direct costs to the NHS are of the order of about uh, five billion pounds a year. But that is small compared to the cost to the wider economy, 
Obesity does lead to a whole raft of ill health, and that ill health leads to losses of economic productivity, more time off work, more disability pensions, um, uh, and so forth. But it isn't just about calories, and I guess I really, um, uh, while saying obesity is important, I don't want people to go away with thinking we can ignore the nutritional composition of the diet. That's not the case at all. And here's some data, which originally I think came from Mike, Mike Rayner's team, which again was in the Food Matters report, which showed that if we could change diet towards the recommendations for good health, increasing fruit and veg, decreasing saturated fat, decreasing salt and sugar, we could potentially avoid um, 70,000 premature deaths um, each year. And to put that in context, that's about 12% of, of total, total deaths. So we have very, very clear evidence, um, at least from the observational data and the modeling, that changes in diet would be beneficial. I'm very much an, an interventionist, and um, here's some data from a whole series of trials we ran in my lab in Cambridge. These are indirect comparisons. These are a whole series of, of different trials, but they were all done in pretty well the same population of overweight people in Cambridge. So they're not, they're broadly, broadly comparable. But the point I want you to take away from this is that when you take people who are middle-aged, overweight, and, but consuming a pretty typical diet of people in the UK, if you intervene, often in quite coercive ways, I have to say, these are efficacy trials, not effectiveness trials, um, and you change their diet, we do see measurable improvements in these biomarkers of cardiovascular risk, whether that's decreases in, in insulin, in blood pressure, in triglycerides, or, or in cholesterol. It is, I think, however, notable that if you um, look at the red bar, this is the impact of weight loss, about 10% weight loss, which I would argue gives you a bigger impact than most of the other changes uh, alone do. And that's partly because in getting people to lose weight, of course, they also consume less fat, less sugar, and less, less salt. So the point is, we have really good evidence of what we need to do to improve the diet, uh, to change the diet, to improve health. The question is not so much what to do, but how. How can we go about getting people to change? And I like to think that if we can understand a little bit more how we can get people to change for health reasons, maybe that will also help us to consider how we might change their diet for, uh, towards a more sustainable um, diet too. We know that um, intensive lifestyle interventions do work. The data I showed you previously was short-term efficacy trials. It was based on biomarkers of cardiovascular risk. But here's a trial out in the, the big wide world with, uh, wasn't done in the UK, it was done in, um, it was done in Finland, which might make them a little bit more compliant. Um, but this was a lifestyle intervention where people were encouraged to control their weight, to eat less fat, increase fiber, and be more physically active. The intervention went on for four years, marked here by the end of the intervention, marked by this dotted line. But what you see plotted here is the incidence of diabetes. What you can see, so these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. What you can see is that in the um, uh, intervention group, shown in the dark red, the incidence of diabetes was not quite, but almost half that which was seen in the control group. And the difference between the two groups persisted even after the end of the active um, intervention suggesting that this dietary change was really having quite long-term uh, health benefits. Most of these intervention studies so far have been predicated on changing the diet purely for health benefit. Um, but what would it mean? What, what sort of diet would we be recommending to people if we wanted a healthy and more sustainable diet? Well, fortunately, some other people have done some work on this already. In fact, it's a really emerging area of research, and Pete Scarborough in the, um, the BHF Health Promotion Group um, is really taking quite, quite a lead on, on much of this work. 
So this is the um, current state of play in terms of dietary advice. It's not my favorite um, communication tool, but this is the eat well plate. And this is supposed to tell you how you should assemble a healthy diet. And it shows the broad proportions of the different food groups um, that make that up. And those have been calculated out here into the different percentages from uh, fruit and vegetables, so-called starchy carbohydrates, um, meat and the protein-rich sources, dairy, and at the bottom here, a small segment where you're allowed to have those foods which are high in fat, sugar, and salt. So the Live Well project, which was um, um, funded by WWF and, and mostly conducted by the University of Aberdeen, sought to um, look at what the greenhouse gas emissions are, which could be attributed to the Eat Well plate. And so if people were to consume a diet in these proportions, as recommended for good health, what would be, if you like, the environmental footprint of that? What you can see very clearly is that the meat and fish component, which is supposedly only 12% of the overall diet, actually accounts for nearly 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, of course, people don't actually eat like the Eat Well plate, much as uh, I might like them to. Um, so this is now the diet modelled to reflect the actual intakes in the UK, or at least um, a decade ago. This is from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. And so what you see is a broadly similar diagram which shows the relative contribution of each of these components. So what the Live Well project did is to use linear programming to then try and model what a diet would look like, which was as close as possible to the eat well balance of good health, but which also achieved the 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, which is necessary if we're going to meet our 2020 targets. So the model was, was constrained by a number of parameters, um, but this is what it uh, looked like. What you see most markedly is this real reduction in the contribution of, uh, of meat and uh, to the diet, down from 23% over here down to, I think it's 12 or 12 or 13 percent. And that decrease in that component is offset by a marked increase in fruit and vegetables and a modest increase in um, uh, bread, rice, uh, pasta, and so forth. This is all modelling. How realistic is this? Well, there's a nice piece of work that, that Pete Scarborough and my old colleagues, uh, uh, Pablo Monsivesis in Cambridge, have been doing. And they very kindly shared this slide with me so I can show it to you today. This is real data taken from the EPIC Norfolk uh, cohort. And what they've done is to look at the uh, essentially the greenhouse gas emissions in the population by quintiles of meat intake. So the 20% of the population who have the lowest meat intake are down here at about, um, about 4 kilos per 2,000 calories, compared to the highest uh, meat consumers, the 20% highest meat consumers, who are at more than double that. So I think it becomes relatively easy to see that if we did follow those eat, uh, live well principles, we would be a, a, and reduced meat consumption you potentially would be able to take these people from the top quintile and move them to a diet which 20% of the population are already managing to consume. But what would be the consequence of the increases in, in the starchy carbohydrates? This is very similar data. Actually, that brings benefits too, because the highest quintile of whole grain consumers actually have the lowest um, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, from their diet. And if we were to increase fruit and veg, that's actually pretty, pretty neutral. So I think there are a number of different ways of looking at this, trying to integrate health and sustainability, which sure leave an awful lot of detail to be resolved, but which give us some very, very clear overarching principles about what is required if we want to move to a healthy and sustainable diet. That leads us with the final challenge, how to make dietary change happen.
And if I knew the answer to that, then life would be a whole lot simpler. Because I realize it's, it's about 30 years now since I first started uh, working in nutrition. And if I've learned anything, it's that dietary change is unbelievably slow. So this is how well we're doing over the last 10 years. And I'm jolly glad that I don't have some performance-related pay scheme which rewards me for um, a, a dietary change. Because actually, progress is in the right direction. But as I said, it's unbelievably slow. Just about there with total fat. But saturated fat remains persistently about 15% higher than the recommendations. Um, likewise, for sugar, this rather curious NMES, non-milk extrinsic sugars, think of it as added sugar, um, and, and portions of, of fruit and vegetables. So why is this, and what, what are we going to do about it? Well, I think part of the problem is that traditional health promotion efforts have relied heavily on education. We are, you know, we have more educational materials, more information than anybody can possibly process. And although, of course, knowledge is an incredibly important prerequisite, maybe not always, but, but often, knowledge is going to help people to find their way to a healthier diet. But what's certainly true is that knowledge alone is simply insufficient. And if we think a little bit more about behavior, I think we start to understand why that is. We all really like to imagine that we're intelligent, rational, educated, informed individuals. And when we see those delicious cakes, or dare I say it, a glass of wine later this evening, we make the conscious decision that it really is not in our best interests to eat that because that will increase our calorie intake, increase our risk of diabetes, and uh, threaten our health in 30 years' time. The problem, certainly if I speak for myself, is that I've eaten the cake before I've thought that through. And the fact is that far, far more of our eating behavior is, is automatic than we really like to imagine or accept. Most of us are prompted by a whole series of cues to consume food and we don't think. We don't, we don't have time. We've got bigger things to worry about, to devote our mental processing capacity to. So we're very, very susceptible to often quite subtle cues around us which stimulate our eating behavior. And I think that relying entirely on education puts far too much emphasis on the reflective decision-making process and fails to acknowledge the importance of automaticity. So we are, I think, beginning to try to look at this somewhat differently and to take a truly public health approach to changing dietary behaviours. And so much of the policy work that I'm involved in is really centred around these three themes, uh, people, products and, um, and promotion. And I just want to run through a few of the schemes that are being tried. Most of these are still founded around making changes to improve health. But what I put to you is that we could now begin to start using similar mechanisms to think about moving people towards a healthy and sustainable diet. So once people have the information, know what they're trying to do, they need to be able to enact that. So labeling, giving people the opportunity to make an informed choice is very important. John was absolutely instrumental um, in getting the concept of front of pack labeling off the ground when he was at the Food Standards Agency and campaigned tirelessly with manufacturers to make this a reality. Um, 10 years or so on, actually we're there. And we have now got all of the major retailers to sign up to a consistent uh, front-of-pack labelling scheme, which will look uh, something like this. So that people not only have the factual information on the fat, sugar and salt content, but they have a clear signal, a cue, that tells them those foods which they can eat freely in green, those in moderation in amber, and foods which they need to eat in small portions or very occasionally in red. The second thing, thinking about products, has also been a real um, UK strength, and that has been around reformulation. Some people call it the health by stealth agenda, because what we've tried to do with reformulation is to change the products that people love 
So they still taste the same, but they're now much healthier, much better for you. And over the last 10 years or so, we have seen really, really marked reductions um, in some of the nutrients of concern in some of the nation's uh, favourite foods. Um, not just cornflakes, but many of breakfast cereals now have 50% less salt than they did 10 years ago. Bread has decreased probably actually by, by more than 30%. And more recently, we've seen some sugary drinks which have had uh, very marked reductions in their, in their sugar content. This actually rather ignores consumer behaviour. It assumes consumers will carry on doing what they were doing before, but it's actually made their diet a little bit, uh, a little bit healthier. And just to demonstrate what impact that has, here's the work on salt. And what we can see is that the salt reformulation work, which has been going on longer than, than fat and sugar, has helped reduce salt intake in the nation by about 15% in a decade. And this is very objective data from the National Urinary Sodium Surveys, where we can get a very, very precise handle on how much salt people are consuming by looking at how much salt is excreted. Still well above the target, but nonetheless, we're making good progress. It is a little bit harder to reformulate products with, to reduce fat and sugar because actually those substances add bulk to the product. So if you take one out, you often, not always, but very often have to add something in its place. And so in fact, what might be a better strategy for dealing with fat and sugar is to control portion size. And this, of course, also has the benefit of cutting calories. As Charles mentioned, I chair the Responsibility Deal Food Network, and we have been uh, trying to negotiate these voluntary agreements with companies um, to cut fat, sugar, and salt, and more recently to cut portion size. So yes, your chocolate bars have shrunk. Yes, I take a degree of responsibility for that. One day you'll thank me. Um, but uh, also, what we've seen really uh, over this summer is a reduction in the can size of, of sugary drinks. And as John, I'm sure, feels a real personal satisfaction about front-of-pack labelling, I have to say, having, um, having been talking to Coke for literally 10 years about reducing the serving size down to 250 mils, I did have a minor cheer this summer when they appeared in the shops. What's been interesting about this is the consumer reaction. Because in terms of the chocolate bars, we initially saw an awful lot of consumer pushback and I think this was largely because the price of chocolate of cocoa has been going up substantially. And so the chocolate companies took cutting the portions as an opportunity simply to hold prices stable and, they would argue, avoid a price rise. Whereas the public interpretation was that they were being ripped off. They were getting a, a smaller Mars bar for the same, for the same price. Interestingly, I think Coke have done it um, in a slightly different way in that they've reduced the pack size and they have now priced it very, very competitively so that um, people who just want the flavour and want a drink but don't necessarily want a huge volume have been attracted to the smaller, cheaper cans. And they're apparently proving to be commercially very, very successful. But what this slide does is make the point that it's not just about getting industry to change. We've got to get consumer demand, or at the very least, public acceptability, working in tandem with that, if this is going to be an economically sustainable um, approach. And I think here, the NGOs, health professionals, academics, have quite an important role to play in beginning to frame the narrative about the benefit of some of these uh, changes. So moving on quite quickly now to think about some of the other strategies people have proposed. I couldn't be here in, in Oxford, particularly not with, with Mike Rayner in the audience, and not mention taxation. Mike has really put the issue of um, taxes on uh, unhealthy food and drinks firmly on, on the agenda, and with a series of papers and modelling, has looked at the potential impact um, on uh, diet-related disease of Interestingly, a 10% tax in Ireland, but I see that in the UK we need a 20% uh, tax. But um, whilst we might debate the detail of the likely effect sizes of a tax, I think there is very good reason, certainly with sugary drinks, to, th to think that this is an important 
um, lever that we may um, have to be able to change uh, to change behaviour. The challenge here is again public acceptability. I don't hear either this government or indeed the opposition really opposing the principle of these sorts of taxes as being potentially beneficial. What I do hear from both sides is huge concern that in a democracy this is simply not going to meet with, uh, with public um, approval. And there's a real question about how we begin to frame that, that debate and the extent to which we're prepared to make um, unpopular changes for the sake of people's health. But if we think about fiscal measures, it's not just taxation. And I think it's really important that we look at the wider, um, um, the wider considerations around economic instruments to change behaviour. We, uh, my colleagues again in Cambridge at the Behaviour and Health Research Unit have just this week, very timely, published um, a paper looking at the impact of one particular promotion. I don't know if you realise, but something like 40% of all the food purchased in the UK at the moment is bought on some kind of promotion. And mostly at one level or another, that's an economic, um, uh, an economic intervention. And so Theresa Marteau and, and colleagues in Cambridge have looked at the impact of the multi-buy ban on alcohol sales in Scotland. And this was published um, in Addiction um, literally earlier, earlier this week. So this was legislation in Scotland which basically prevented uh, so-called bog-offs, buy one, get one free, or other kinds of multi-buy sales. And this is essentially a quasi-experimental um, evaluation comparing Scotland with England. What you see, if we just look at the beer one, this is sales in Scotland and England in the year before the ban. This is where the ban came in, the red line, and this is sales in Scotland and England after the ban. You can see it for each of the individual categories and here for pure alcohol totaled up. There is a table, of course, in the paper which gives you all the detailed statistical analysis of this, but if you, like me, like to look at the picture, I don't think you need an awful lot of stats to say it's very hard to suggest that banning multibuys has actually reduced sales of alcohol. It does not appear to have been an effective mechanism to change behaviour. Why is that? Well, when you look at it in more detail, what you discover is that people were buying less on each shopping occasion, but they were buying it more frequently. They were popping out in the middle of the week to buy a top-up of beer because they bought less um, at, at the weekend. Just one other example, um, I've become increasingly interested in what happens in store. Because consumers tell us they intend to eat healthily. They aspire to a healthy diet. 86% of people want to eat a healthy diet. But when I look at what's in their trolley as I'm queuing to get out of the supermarket, I don't see many of those healthy eating aspirations being played out. So what happens between coming into the store and, and the checkout? What happens is, once again, you are not making a completely free choice. Your choices are being steered and engineered even by the environment within store. And this is just one example of so-called gondola ends, the end of the aisle um, in, uh, in a supermarket. <clears throat> and we looked at the sales of three different categories. This isn't making any distinction on healthy or unhealthy, it's just looking at the whole category. And what you see, if you just look at this line here, is that there is a marked uplift in sales when these products are put on the end of the aisle, equivalent to about 23% for beer, up to a 50% increase when carbonates are put on the gondola end. And for Mike's benefit, we translated that into what would be the equivalent in terms of, of, of price, and actually it's equivalent to somewhere between a 4 and 22% um, uh, reduction in price in terms of its effect on consumer behaviour. So I think we need, um, in the academic world, to really start understanding this better. I'm sure the commercial marketeers know this perfectly well already, but we need to get this information into the public domain so we can begin to devise intelligent and effective policies to intervene and shape uh, purchasing behaviour, which we know is an incredibly strong determinant of what people will later eat. <clears throat> 
It's not just, of course, what happens in store. The wider promotional environment matters too. And I think we're beginning to um, see data emerging, experimental data, which really makes clear the impact that advertising can have on food choice. This is um, data from Jason Halford's lab in, in Liverpool. They brought children in and um, on a Saturday morning and they showed them some films. And there was an advertisement, uh, advertisement break when they were either shown advertisements for food or for toys. So food in the grey bars, toys in the white bars. And after the film, they were offered a snack. Not one of the foods that had been in the advert, something different. But what you see is this marked difference in intake. After they'd seen the food-related adverts, the children consumed two to three times more food than after they'd seen the adverts which included toys, suggesting a very strong priming effect on, on later consumption. Perhaps even more worryingly, the obese children appeared to be particularly susceptible to these external cues and saw an even greater um, increase in their consumption. These are just a few examples, and I'm going to stop really my examples there, um, uh, but they're just designed to demonstrate to you that I think we are beginning to identify new ways in which we might begin to intervene to shape people's behavior and to, in a way, change the environment in which people find themselves so that they are um, encouraged to make the healthier rather than the less healthy food choices. As I said earlier, this has all been largely predicated on what's good for health, but I think we are now at a point of understanding um, how to move, um, what we need to do if we're going to achieve a sustainable diet, and that almost certainly includes reducing meat consumption. I mentioned Tara once already, but here's another plug for her work. Tara's developed what I think is a really neat way of, of looking at this, which is the, the 5R strategy to reduce meat consumption. Um, and many of these um, principles will resonate heavily with those I've talked about in terms of making other dietary changes. And the challenge, I think, for us now is to put this all together into a coherent package for consumers um, and then to begin to uh, start reshaping uh, the environment to encourage those healthier choices. So what I hope that I've really um, set out for you today is a situation in which there is a really pressing need for us to rethink the nature of the food we eat. Eating is, at the end of the day, a voluntary um, activity, uh, but consumers, however well-intentioned they are, I think are going to struggle to identify and adhere to a healthy, sustainable diet because it's fraught with trade-offs, um, and indeed in some cases with some economic imperatives. But likewise, industry are going to struggle to transform their offer unless that runs in parallel with consumer demand. And there's a really important tension that we need to play out between these two components. Clearly, government has an incredibly important um, leadership role to play in this. Much of what they do really frames, uh, frames the system. But I think it's also important that civil society groups, and I include with that not just the NGOs, but academics and the health professional community, really need to step up to the plate a little bit in this area too. I think, quite honestly, that health professionals have been very under-engaged in the issues around food, not only food and health, but certainly around food and sustainability. But I think there's real opportunities for them. We know that um, health professionals are very well placed to work on an individual level with people, but they also are such um, uh, respected and credible um, figures within the community that I think there's an advocacy role which we need to encourage them to step up to. We've seen them really play that out in relation uh, to tobacco control, and I think we now need to harness them into the food debate as well. It's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm particularly pleased to, to, to be here in Oxford in the Department of Primary Care, because I think there are tremendous opportunities for health professionals to contribute um, to this debate. <clears throat> 
I know there's quite a few of my, my colleagues from primary care here today, which is fantastic, and I hope it's going to be the start of, of closer relationships between the department and, and the future food programme. So, enough from me. Um, I think probably what I have shown you is that there's no um, escaping the magnitude of the task ahead. Frankly, I think what needs to be done to move towards a sustainable diet really dwarfs our efforts on saturated fat and a bit more fruit and vegetables. It's far bigger and more complex um, than that. To make progress, we need some real joint working. We need to upskill individuals, give them the resources they need to be able to, to scale the mountain. But what we also need to do is to change the environment so that we make the path to the summit just a little bit easier for everyone. Thank you.